supernatural miracles associated with him. He's most famous now for his prophecy of the popes. Since Nostradamus' prophecy about Pope Francis, the public has been even more surprised to witness another prophecy about him from St. Malachi. All eyes are on the man leading the church because it is unknown what will come to pass in his time. Is it the end or just a transition for a beginning that marks the triumph of Christ? In the spirit of reverence for God's Holy Spirit, join us in revealing all the mysteries of St. Malachi's prophecy. The Last Man of the Church There would be only one more Pope after Benedict. Don't be afraid when you hear this. In 1139, St. Malachi set out from Ireland on a harrowing pilgrimage to Rome. Upon sighting the Eternal City, he fell to the ground and began murmuring Latin verses, each signifying the future destiny of the popes. His words were suppressed for over 300 years by the Roman Catholic Church, yet to this day, 90% of the saints' prophecies have come true, unfolding in chronological sequence in 111 medieval Latin mottos, and a final coda, that together hide clues identifying the succession of 112 pontiffs up to Judgment Day. The prophecy of St. Malachi is actually a set of prophecies written by an Irish priest, the prophecy contains a list of more than a hundred brief mottos said to describe more than a hundred popes, beginning with Celestine II, who served in the office from 1143 to 44. Counting forward, the prophecy would tie the next-to-last motto on the list to the now-retired Benedict XVI. In a series of 112 cryptic Latin phrases, the Irish saint predicts the Roman Catholic popes. However, his prediction for the 112th and current pope Francis is far more chilling. He predicted there would be only one more pope after Benedict, and during his reign comes the end of the world. So Francis could be the last. St. Malachi's final prediction in full is, In the final persecution of the Holy Roman Church there will reign Peter the Roman, who will feed his flock amid many tribulations, after which the seven-hilled city will be destroyed and the dreadful judge will judge the people the end. Despite the current Popey being an Argentina cardinal who chose a Francis as his papal name, doomsday believers have tried to salvage the prophesy by arguing that Giorgio Mario Bergoglio has Peter somewhere in his birth name and that Pope Francis really is a Roman since his parents are Italian immigrants who moved to Argentina. Pope Benedict was the 111th Pope from St. Malachi. This means Pope Francis is 112. Saint Malachi said that during the last papacy, God would judge his pope and city of seven hills, which means Rome would be destroyed. The Bible prophesies the destruction of Rome, the city of seven hills in Revelation 17, which says that the whore of Babylon will be seated on seven mountains. The destruction will take place at the end of the Great Tribulation and right at the time of the Battle of Armageddon. Furthermore, the Bible prophesied that the Pope who is in office at this time of the Antichrist will form an alliance with him and will become the prophesied false prophet. It's very interesting that many Catholic prophecy books teach there is an evil Pope coming and that he will be the last Pope. As for the prophecy concerning the 111th Pope, Pope Benedict, the prophecy says of him, Gloria Olivae, which means the glory of the olive. The Order of Saint Benedict is also known as the Olivetans, which many claims make Malachi's prophecies correct. The next and final Pope then should be Peter Romanus. Many of the prophecies are spot on. For example, the one about Pope Urban VIII is Lilium et Rosa, which means the lily and the rose. He was a native of Florence, and the arms of Florence feature a fleur-de-lis. Pope John Paul II is de labor solis, meaning of the eclipse of the sun. The Pope was born on May 18, 1920, during a solar eclipse. Peregrinus Apostolicus, or Pilgrim Pope, which designates Pius VI, appears to be verified by his many journeys to new lands. So will Pope Francis, the 112th Pope, be the last Pope? 
Will he be the false prophet and evil pope that the Catholic prophecy books speak about? Were you also aware that Vatican means hill of the fortune tellers and soothsayers? It's all interesting, isn't it? The Irish seer of the 12th century has said it will be so. Time will tell. The successor of the Apostle Peter. As the world's eyes fall on the former Jorge Mario Bergoglio, some wonder if he was prophesied to be the last Roman Catholic pontiff before Jesus Christ returns. Others, however, ask a more fundamental question. Is he really the successor of the Apostle Peter? Bergoglio's choice of papal name, Francis I, was striking enough. It reminds us of the medieval Francis of Assisi, founder of the Franciscan religious order. That Francis was known for his itinerant preaching, simple lifestyle, and his stated mission to repair the Roman Church. But it is not this association with Assisi or his training as a Jesuit that gives Pope Francis his presumed authority. Rather, it is his supposed heritage as the successor of the Apostle Peter, whom Roman Catholics consider the first bishop of Rome. But was Francis's papacy predicted hundreds of years in advance? Some have pointed to the mysterious prophecy of St. Malachi as evidence that Francis was predicted to be the final pope before Christ returns. The Catholic Encyclopedia states, It has been noticed concerning Petrus Romanus, who according to Malachi's list is to be the last pope, that the prophecy does not say that no popes will intervene between him and his predecessor designated Gloria Olivae. It merely says that he is to be the last so that we may suppose as many popes as we please before Peter the Roman. In the case if Francis I need not be the final pope, what can we learn about his connection to the first bishop of Rome? The assumption of papal primacy based on apostolic succession from Peter has been standard Roman Catholic teaching for centuries. It rests on a particular interpretation of one key passage of Scripture in which Jesus stated, And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the powers of death shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. In the original Greek text, we should notice that Jesus' statement is actually a play on words. The Greek word for Peter is Petros, meaning a small stone, and the Greek word for rock is Petra, meaning a huge rock or mountain. The Bible clearly shows that Jesus Christ is the rock upon which the church was founded. You can look at the Bible verses I put on the screen to better understand what I mean. Jesus was referring to himself and his teachings as the Petra on which the church was to be founded and acknowledging Peter, a Petros, as one of the foundation stones. This agrees with other scriptures that show the church was not founded upon Peter alone, but was built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Is the Antichrist the current pope or a future pope? Throughout history, many people have speculated about the identity of the Antichrist. Some of these speculations have pointed to various popes of the Roman Catholic Church, is the current pope the Antichrist? What about a future pope? How about the prophecy of the saint? A proof text for those who believe that a pope will be the Antichrist is Revelation 17, 9. This calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman is seated. The context does refer to the Antichrist, and the woman is Babylon the Great, a picture of an evil world system in the end times. The seven mountains are sometimes identified as Rome, home of seven hills. While it is possible that Babylon is associated with Rome, the verse does not provide enough detail to identify the Pope as the Antichrist. Most likely, these seven mountains are not a reference to Rome. The following verse, Revelation 17.10 says, They are also seven kings, five of whom have fallen, one is the other has not yet come, and when he does come, he must remain only a little while. Thus, the reference to seven hills is not a geographical location, but a symbolic representation of seven kings. These would consist of five fallen kingdoms. 
Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Greece, one existing kingdom in John's day, Rome, and one future empire, the Antichrists. Whoever the Antichrist turns out to be, we know he will deny Jesus Christ as Lord. 1 John chapter 4 verses 2 to 3 says, By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. Further, the Antichrist will deny both the Father and the Son. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. 2 John 1 7 also notes, For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Such a one is the deceiver and the Antichrist. The Antichrist will even deny the existence of Jesus coming to earth in the flesh or human form. Since past and current popes affirm that Jesus came in the flesh, it would be difficult to see how he could be the Antichrist. Whoever the false prophet turns out to be, the final world deception and the final apostasy will be great, and the whole world will be caught up in it. The deceivers and false teachers we see today are the forerunners of the Antichrist and the false prophet, and we must not be deceived by them. These false teachers abound, and they are moving us toward a final satanic kingdom. We must faithfully proclaim the saving gospel of Jesus Christ and rescue the souls of men and women from the coming disaster. But don't rush to judge anything about this venerable Pope. He is a child of God. His virtues and good actions have comforted many wounded hearts. All of that will be revealed in a few minutes. Saint Malachy's Prophecy of Pope Benedict When John Paul II died on April 2, 2005, Articles were written pointing out that the Pope who would replace John Paul II would be the 111th Pope. An article writer wrote, The next Pope, whose name will be announced shortly, is described in the prophecies as Gloria Olive, or the Glory of the Olive. What exactly does this clue mean? We cannot tell as yet. Some believe that it means he will come from the Benedictine order, which is symbolized by the olive. Others argue that the olive signifies Israel. As in the case of many prophets and seers, St. Malachi's clues often become clear to us only after the fact. The article continued, As the College of Cardinals works feverishly to elect the successor to Pope John Paul II over the next few days, they will have to wrestle with various criteria, political, organizational, theological, and moral. And to make things more complicated, they may also want to make sure that, in order to forestall any further doom, saying, whoever they choose has absolutely nothing to do with the words, the glory of the olive. But with these things you can never really tell. The description often manifests itself only much later. On April 19th, Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger of Germany was elected as the new pope. Everyone breathed a collective sigh of relief. After all, there was no such thing as a Ratzinger olive. It looked like the St. Malachi prophecy had failed. However, Ratzinger announced the name under which he would occupy the papacy, Benedict XVI. There is always a reason behind the names that new popes choose to reign under. So, why Benedict? The original Benedict became the founder of the Benedictine order one of the most prominent orders in the Roman Catholic Church, and the symbol of the Benedictine order? The olive. Now Malachi's prophecy seemed more credible than ever. Pope Benedict was 78 years of age when he began his papacy. At that time, because of his advanced age, it was obvious that his reign as the Bishop of Rome could not last too long. Everyone understood the next pope, according to St. Malachi, would be the last pope. Malachi also said the church would be judged, Rome would be destroyed, and implied that the end of the world would come during this final papacy. But then, 
He resigned in 2013 due to health reasons, and at the end of 2022, he passed away at the Mater Ecclesiae Monastery in the Vatican. During the time of Pope Francis, St. Malachy's prophecy once again received attention. The 112th Pope On March 12, 2013, the Cardinals entered the Vatican and doors were locked. Would this be a long conclave or a short one? No one knew. The first papal ballot was taken that afternoon. Soon black smoke emanated from the chimney of the Sistine Chapel. No pope was elected. On March 13th, two votes were taken in the morning. Again, black smoke, no election. After lunch, the cardinals were to cast two more ballots. What was going on inside the Sistine Chapel? No one outside knew. Total secrecy was enforced. The afternoon session continued late into the evening. No smoke, white or black. Because the signal was delayed so long, some began to speculate that a pope had been chosen. Finally, the white smoke billowed out of the chimney of the Sistine Chapel. Soon thereafter, the announcement was made, Habimus Papam, we have a pope. Francis is the first non-European pope and the first pope ever elected from the Jesuit order. Since becoming a priest, Bergoglio has been especially known for living a humble life and ministering to the poor. While Archbishop of Buenos Aires, he refused to live in the elegant bishop residence, choosing rather to live in a small apartment. He declined the use of the normal archbishop's limousine, instead riding the bus to his office each day. As soon as Bergoglio was elected, it became obvious that he intended to continue living his frugal and humble lifestyle as Pope. When it was time to present him to the crowd waiting in St. Peter's Square and to the world, he declined to step up on the platform provided for him. Instead, he said to the other prelates, I'll stay down here with you. Before he bestowed the traditional papal blessing on the crowd below, he asked them first of all to pray for him. A few days later, during Easter week, he washed the feet of 12 young inmates in a nearby prison, including two female prisoners and a Muslim. Then, Pope Francis decided that he would not reside in the papal residence used by his predecessors since 1903. Instead, he would make his home in the much more modest Vatican guest house. It immediately became apparent to all that this was going to be a much different pope. Pope Francis, a name never taken by a pope before, washing the feet of common prisoners and refusing to live in the papal palace. Pope Francis has been a Jesuit for more than 40 years, so Jesuit history is his history. Francis led the Jesuits in Argentina from 1973 to 1979, a period during which the order was essentially feuding with the Vatican. As Archbishop of Buenos Aires, he raised awareness of poverty and spoke about social justice. Pope Francis's outward simplicity hides a steely, determination to advance Jesuit principles, especially on the importance of traditional Catholic teachings and protection of the poor and the oppressed. That determination emerged during Bergoglio's service as the top Jesuit leader of Argentina beginning in 1973. It was said of him, he was a tough guy who made sure his men towed the mark. I think you'll find a man who is conservative theologically but very strong on matters of social justice, one of his associates said. With such a righteous and charitable person, is it possible that he is on the opposing side of God? I guess not. False prophet at the end time. A false prophet is mentioned as a key evil leader in the end times in Revelation 13. He is also called the second beast. The Antichrist is the first beast. He will operate with the Antichrist and Satan to deceive many during the tribulation period. The description of the false prophet says, He will rise out of the earth, have two lamb's horns, and will speak like a dragon, likely meaning with deception like Satan. It will have the Antichrist's authority and will cause people to worship the Antichrist. The false prophet will perform signs, including fire from the sky, and will have an image of the Antichrist built. He will cause the image to appear alive and will kill those who reject the Antichrist. Further, 
he will cause people to take the mark of the beast. Another activity of the false prophet will be to help assemble people for the battle of Armageddon. Revelation 16 shares, And I saw, coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet, three unclean spirits like frogs. For they are demonic spirits, performing signs, who go abroad to the kings of the whole world to assemble them for battle on the great day of God the Almighty. The conclusion of the false prophet's work will be judgment. Revelation 19.20 prophecies, And the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet, who in its presence had done the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped its image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. At the end of the Millennial Kingdom, Satan will be unbound for one final battle of God's enemies against him. Revelation 20.10 provides the final judgment of the false prophet. The devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Though he may briefly escape, his doom will be eternal punishment. We need not fear this false prophet now, but there are many other false prophets in existence today. Those who promote teachings contrary to the clear teachings of Scripture are to be rejected, knowing they will receive similar judgment in the end. As Timothy says, For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. How to Face Antichrist In the first three centuries of its existence, the early church went through several periods of intense persecution by the Roman emperors. One of the most terrible was the persecution under the emperor Decius. Many Christians were fed to lions, burned at the stake, or tortured to death. But more tragically, many Christians deserted the faith, apostatizing in the face of persecution and physical suffering. The church had gone through many periods of persecution, but in the end, it survived. Though bloodied, the church is unbowed and has been purified and strengthened by the terrible suffering. There are three things you need to observe. First one, the greatest threats come from within the church. There are three things to observe regarding the dangers and threats to the church. First, the greatest threats do not come from outside the church, but from within the church. The Antichrist, the man of sin, might be a person within the church, though he will also have political influence. Of the greatest concern to us is the fact that the Antichrist will be a capable church leader. In the world today, we have many influential church leaders, but if they are not right with God, they will become a powerful tool in Satan's hands to destroy the church. This could happen if they fall into the grip of sin, covetousness, or greed. It is our duty to denounce sin where there is sin and evil where there is evil, and to call a spade a spade. Second, most Christians are easily deceived. The second frightening observation is that most Christians are gullible and ill-equipped to deal with falsehood. They cannot see through a lie or discern false teaching as to whether it is biblically correct or not. It frightens me that it is easy to mislead Christians, even educated Christians, long-time Christians, or theologically trained Christians. They are so gullible that the Antichrist will have a walkover. How will you defend yourself against the clever and erudite learning of the Antichrist? You will be like a sheep heading for slaughter. I can at any time hold a meeting in which I will defend in your presence a doctrine that you and I know to be false and will challenge you to break my arguments. But when the Antichrist comes with his skill in the scriptures, how will you uphold the truth? I fear that you will be defenseless against his deception. In the temptation of Jesus, Satan kept on quoting the Bible to Jesus. If you think you know your Bible, Satan knows it far better. He knows how to quote from the Bible in a way that you cannot rebut. I am saying this so that you will not place any confidence in yourself or in your training. Our confidence is based on one thing, 
a right relationship with God, in which the Holy Spirit, God's Spirit, will lead us into the truth. When you walk in a living relationship with God, He will preserve you and will bring Scripture to your attention. That's why you need to pray regularly to ask God to enlighten you in the right direction. Third, beware of religious legalism that is a cloak for a sinful life. The third thing I want to warn you about is this. If you are not walking in a living relationship with God, you will gradually become disobedient to God and susceptible to the devil's manipulation. Many professing Christians do not know God, and they are stumbling blocks who cause the non-Christians to say, these Christians are no different from me, and they are right. Such Christians are not any different because they are every bit under the bondage of sin as anyone else. If you are a Christian, examine your life as to whether you are living under God's lordship moment by moment. But if you are living instead under the lordship of sin, religion will become a cover for your sins. What does the lordship of sin mean? It means the same as it means for the non-Christian. You don't know the spiritual purpose of your life. Your life is governed by the same motives as the non-Christian. Self-centeredness, pride, greed, love of money, all of which can be hidden. There may be a subtle pride, a hidden greed, a disguised love of money. 